marks the, the one-year anniversary of when we shut down uh, the church. And for 13 weeks, we existed out of sync with, I think, one of God's purposes for the church, which is to meet together in person to praise His glorious grace. It was a year ago that there was so much confusion, a year ago that there was so much disappointment going on. You know, not only were churches closing, but schools closed abruptly, and businesses closed abruptly, and sporting events, prom, graduation was like no other last year, and so much more just gone, just like that. Now, I'm not here to criticize or prop up any of the mitigation strategies that were put in place, but one thing that we can all agree on is that this has been a year of profound disappointment for many of us. There are some really good things that have come out of this past year, but by and large, many of us have been on this sort of roller coaster of uh, hope and disappointment. And ironically, many of us became experts of, of, uh, of charts and data like, like this one. I'll remind you of that. Many of us remember seeing that last spring. And, um, and uh, the strategy was at the very beginning of the pandemic that uh, was to, to flatten the curve. And when I look at a chart like this, yeah, I mean, we can go and we can talk about health strategy and everybody's got their own opinion and that sort of thing. But uh, at this point, I don't necessarily look at this as far as health data, but rather I, I see a chart of how many of our lives feel. And it's not just in a pandemic. I mean, this is just the life of the normal human condition, that we have ebbs and flows of, of hope and discouragement and and encouragement, and letdowns. And it's just up and down and up and down. And we have this upward slope, and then something happens. We lose a job. Uh, a child gets sick. Uh, someone that we're close to passes away. Maybe we get a diagnosis. Maybe we're betrayed. Maybe our marriage suddenly seems very, very unstable. You know, we could go on and on. You've been there. You know that feeling. Everything is, is great. Everything seems fine. And then just, it's like the rug was just pulled out from under you. In our passage this morning, we continue the story of Joseph. Joseph's story is the quintessential story uh, of hopes lifted and dreams dashed. Joseph was a young man of just 17 years old, favored above all of his brothers and betrayed by them and sold by them into slavery. He was bought by a high-ranking official in Pharaoh's cabinet and then quickly entrusted with his entire estate. However, when this man's wife uh, tried unsuccessfully to seduce Joseph into an affair with, him, with her, she falsely accuses him of rape, and he was sent to Pharaoh's prison. So here's a guy that right now in our story is probably in his 20s. This is a guy that should be starting to settle down and start having a family and, and move on with life, and yet he is here languishing within an Egyptian prison. But as we have seen all throughout Joseph's story, and we will continue to see throughout Joseph's story, that God was with Joseph. And even more than that, what Joseph is experiencing, uh, whether it be from his brothers or whether it be from Mrs. Potiphar or whether it be from his time in prison, all of this is the very purpose and plan of God for Joseph's life and the future of his people. We don't always see God's hand in our disappointment. But we can glean from this chapter is how God in the person of of Jesus Christ gives us the only true way that we can deal with disappointment. And we can reach that conclusion in three ways. The first is, is that we need to beware of cynicism. Beware of giving in to cynicism. Uh, when we are sinned against, 
or maybe we just have a, a major disappointment that thing doesn't, something doesn't work out the way that we wanted to. What is a typical response? Maybe you're let down. Maybe you're sad. Maybe you're angry. I mean, there's plenty of country songs that can attest to that. Maybe you're reclusive. You, you, you just you go quiet. and Maybe you go hide out with yourself for a little while. When you're down and out about your circumstances, whether it just be circumstances or whether it be a result of being hurt by sin, maybe we feel all of these things at once. And often what happens when we don't deal with these emotions in a biblically healthy way is that it starts to fester in our hearts. And often what happens then when it, when it begins to fester in our heart is that it begins to rot our hearts and we become bitter. Bitter against the world. Bitter against certain people. Bitter against certain ideas. And soon after, cynicism begins to kick in. You might think of, uh, of the, the woman that uh, was scorned by her lovers, that was her lover and singular, lover, and might say something like, oh, I will never trust men again. Every single one of them are liars and dogs. Or you uh, might hear someone who was burned by the church at some point and say something like, well, all those Christians are hypocrites and I don't want anything to do with them. Well, that sentiment would be right. We are hypocrites, but the, uh, the heart has become hard to the possibility that there is some good in the church and in God's people. Or perhaps you've run into, or maybe you are that person that lives by the victim mentality, that everything in the cosmos and the universe exists to make your life terrible. You're always the one that bad things happen to. And when something happens that you might not like, oh, that figures that that would happen to me. I'm telling you, it's really easy to fall into these mindsets. Painful experiences often create scars, and sometimes scars take a really long time to heal. Joseph had, in a worldly sense, every reason to be bitter and cynical. I, I can just imagine the mental and spiritual war that Joseph would have as he lay in bed at night trying to, to sleep. And if it were me, I'd be honest. I would have some serious resentment issues toward my brothers. And I would have some bitterness towards this wicked woman who wrongfully accused me when I was doing the right thing and I get put in prison for it. But Joseph doesn't give in to that temptation. Let's back up into chapter 39 in verses 20 through 23. It says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whoever, whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. Because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So I don't know what's going on in Joseph's heart here, but whatever's going on in his heart, it isn't bitterness. Because you don't get into the good graces of a prison guard in such a way like this by, by being a bitter and bratty jerk. God is with Joseph here. And showed mercy to him by giving him a servant's heart, even in the midst of his own heartbreak. Joseph was far more mature at this ripe age of 20-something than most of us, dare I say, all of us would ever hope to be. 
And as we said last week, in the midst of tragedy, it's true that God was with Joseph. Because of that, Joseph was with God. And so Joseph is in charge of all these prisoners. And, and then one day, verse, verse 1 of chapter 40 tells us this. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and the baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them into custody, the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. So Joseph here is ministering as a prisoner to these other prisoners. He's basically the, the chaplain here. And then in the motif of dreams that comes back into the story here. Look at verse 5. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, and each to his own dream, and each dream with his own interpretation. And when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody, who in, uh, uh, custody in this master's house, why, why are your faces downcast today? So time out here. Push pause. This is a significant detail about the character of Joseph. He's in prison with, at this point, absolutely no hope of any change in his circumstance. He is stuck here. And his concern is not with himself, but with the emotional state of his fellow prison mates. Prison has a, hard way, has a way of hardening people. I can imagine that most prisoners would see guys like this and see them as, as weak. Say, why don't you keep your dreams to yourself? I got my own problems. I don't want to hear about yours. But Joseph overlooks his own problems and is rather concerned about these men. Look in verse 8. They said to him, we've had dreams, and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said, do not all interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So if you remember all the way back in Genesis chapter 37, it was Joseph's dreams that got him into trouble. He had two dreams. The first was that he was out harvesting the, uh, the fields with his brothers. And as they were tying their sheaves of wheat together, all of their sheaves bowed down and prostrated in front of his. His brothers knew immediately what that meant. And the second dream was that there were 11 stars and the sun and the moon that were bowing down to him, not as a star, but him as a person. They knew plainly what that meant. The sun and the moon, mother and father, and the stars being his, his brothers. And this set his brothers on a murderous path uh, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 20, in which they said, Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what became of his dreams. So in Joseph's story, dreams were the catalyst that eventually led him to where he is now. But he isn't bitter. He hasn't given up. In fact, his confidence in the Lord seems even stronger at this point, though he has no evidence to believe that his, his dreams will materialize, he still seems to believe in the validity of what his dreams were. And he wants to help these men know the Lord by interpreting their dreams for them. For them. Do you see how incredible this is? Do you see how kind the Lord is to him? And how the Lord is, is giving mercy to him? 
instead of letting his heart collect gangrene, he has Joseph in prison bearing witness to God's goodness. Instead of sulking in self-pity and cynicism, the Lord puts it into Joseph to make himself useful for the good of others and for the kingdom of God. We need to realize that we serve this same God. The grace that was available to Joseph is available to you. We can sit and put a pity party on for ourselves, or we can make ourselves useful for the kingdom in spite of our circumstances. And the second thing that we need to do is hold on to faith. Hold on to faith. So these men end up telling Joseph about their dreams, and the first to recount his dream is, is Pharaoh's cupbearer. And a cupbearer was a role that, that's really been... Uh, Historically, it's been a, a real position. In fact, um, there, are, there are stories about President Donald Trump even having a cupbearer. And what a cupbearer does is the, uh, in, in antiquity is that they would be the one to, to mix the cocktails for the, the kings and the emperors. They would squeeze the grapes and make the wine for the, the king or the emperor. And not only that, but they were also to test the drink before it was given to the king. And if the, uh, if the uh, cupbearer drinks and he becomes sick or he becomes dead and he was poisoned, well, then he did his job. He was protecting the king by being the, the cupbearer. And in this dream that he has starts in verse 9. He recounts, in my dream... There was a vine before me, and on that vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. When I was in high school, it was before I, had, I was a Christian, I had this book called 10,000 Dreams Interpreted. It was this kooky book in which you would uh, try to remember all the objects or scenarios that happened to you in your dream. And then you would go and you'd find it sort of in this dictionary thing. There's 10,000 of them. And then the, the, the book would, uh, would tell you what you're psychologically trying to process or it would relate some hokey prophecy that's going to be in your, in your life. And it was ridiculous, and I obviously know better now, but notice here that Joseph doesn't run to Barnes & Noble. He doesn't go to the library to consult some pagan book in order to interpret the cupbearer's dream. It says the Lord immediately gave him the meaning of that dream. Look in verse 12. This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days, and three days Pharaoh will lift up your head to restore and restore your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. I can imagine the, the cupbearer that, that his heart just starts stirring. Chris had it right over there. He's like, yes, my ticket is, I'm getting out of here. Three days, I can handle anything, anything for three days, and I'm out of here. Because in antiquity, to lift up someone's head was to show favor. And in this situation, it would have been restorative favor. When a king made a public appearance, everyone would, would typically bow down and they would put their heads down in a prostrated position. And the king would come and he would lift up the favored one's heads. And when they did that, they had favor with the king and they were in his good graces. And so Joseph is saying here that the, the king is going to lift up your head and you are going to be restored. So yes, bingo, this is exactly what I want. So encouraged by this positive interpretation, the baker then is quick to <laughs> relate his dream. I want some of that. My dream's kind of like that. And he says in verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was fa favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. 
there were three cake baskets on my head. And the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three, uh, the three baskets are three days. Same amount of time here. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. Which was... Uh, a nice way of saying you were going to be hanged. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. Boy, how would you like to be that, the bearer of that news? <laughs> hey, cut bear, guess what? You get to party again in three days. You get to go back to your position. You get your home back, get your family back. It's going to be awesome. Uh, yeah, baker, yeah, you baked your last cake. You're... Uh, Three days from now, you're, you're going to get it. A hanging would have robbed an Egyptian of all dignity because they placed a really high value on how dead bodies were treated. And as a commission for his services, Joseph gives one request to the cupbearer in verse 14. He says, only remember me when it's well with you. And please do me this kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. So jo Joseph uses this opportunity to instill hope in his heart. Remember me. Tell Pharaoh about me. He's not one of those desperate store owners that's sort of telling their clients, go tell your friends about us. He is imploring this man to show kindness. And that word kindness, there is the word hesed, which is the same word that we get uh, like steadfast love or faithful love or unending uh, goodness and kindness to us. It's all over the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. And he wants this guy to show the same faithfulness to him that God shows us by mentioning him to Pharaoh. Now, I'm just guessing here, but Ron, you have experience in prison, uh, not in prison, but as a prison guard, right? There's a lot of innocent people in prison, isn't there? Yeah. But Joseph truly is innocent here. Ron did not go to prison, by the way. He was, he was a guard. Yes. Um, Joseph is correct. And notice the irony of how Joseph describes a situation He's in a pit. He was thrown into a pit by his brothers. And now here he is describing his, his place in prison as a pit. And maybe, just maybe, this cupbearer that is going to go back to Pharaoh is his ticket out of here. And what do you do when... What you want or what you're hoping for takes way longer than you want it to. What do you do when it feels like I'm being faithful, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, I'm praying, I am treating others with, with kindness and respect, I am, I'm, I'm sacrificing for the good of others, but it just seems like God isn't listening, it seems like God isn't coming through the answer is we make like Joseph. We hold on to faith. We hold out for God. Now David knew what this, what this looked like and he wrote it in Psalm 13. He said this, he said, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Have you ever felt like that? Well, David tells us what he did. It's the same thing that Joseph did. Verse 5 of Psalm 13. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully 
with me. And so he essentially says, God, I see what's happening here, Lord, and it's not what I want, but you know what, Lord? I made the commitment to you. I know that your steadfast love is good, and I know that you are for me and you are not against me, so I'm going to stand here and I'm going to wait. And I'm going to wait on those promises of you because you have promised it to me. I've seen your goodness to me in my life. I've seen how you have been faithful to me. And even though I might have to wait a little bit, while, a little bit longer, Lord, I am willing to wait. So we need to hold on to faith. But third and finally, we need to put hope in Christ alone. Put hope in Christ alone. You know, I can just imagine Joseph because I would be in the same mindset as he would be. Man, I would just be, just be giddy. Oh man, my brothers, they sold me into slavery and oh, I was in slavery and then I was falsely accused and have been in prison ever since. But boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh, my meal ticket is coming. It's gonna happen. Everything that Joseph said would happen, happens. The cupbearer gets reinstated the baker gets hanged. This is it. <laughs> it's finally going to happen after all of this. But then verse 23, reality hits. It says, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And all of a sudden, Joseph flattened the curve. He went from high expectation to almost a depressive state. Chapter 41 tells us that it takes two years for the baker, uh, for the, for the cupbearer to remember Joseph. 730 days, give or take. 17,520 minutes. 63,072,000 seconds of silence and waiting. I wonder how long it took Joseph to realize this isn't going to happen. I'm not getting out of here. It's then that the hope really dashes you know, God's plan is completely invisible to Joseph, which tends to make waiting a little bit harder. Maybe you feel something like that right now. Man, you've been praying for years. You're exhausted. You're confused. You're sad. You've seen your share of flattened curves. And you're tired of waiting on God. And maybe, just maybe, you feel like Joseph. You've been forgotten about. And it's all up to you and you're not even sure how you can keep going. You need to hear today that though God's plan may be veiled in your eyes, he is well aware of your situation. He has not abandoned you. Though you may wonder why you are still in the pit, he is working his plan out for you in your life. We may not understand why you're going through this, but God is infinitely good. He is infinitely wise. He is infinitely loving, and we are his children. And everything that happens to us then is part of the story that he is writing in our lives to make us more like himself. He guaranteed this. And we can know that we can trust him in this chiefly because of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In his life, he knew what it was like to be rejected by his family and by his fellow countrymen. He knew what it was like to be sold for silver. He knew what it was like to be spiritually and mentally and physically suffer at the hands of wicked men. When he was nailed to a cross, naked and out for shame, 
He was forgotten. And not just by his, his friends, not just by his countrymen, but by God the Father. And while he was hanging on the cross, he quoted Psalm 22, verse 1, when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he could have gone on to quote some more of that psalm. Verse 2 says, God, why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry day by day. But you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. All it is through the story of Joseph and the story of Psalm 22 that we need to get into our hearts today that though we experience challenges and pains, though we experience suffering, because Jesus experienced the abandonment of God the Father, we will never be forgotten by him. When Jesus was, was dying, one of the criminals who was on his side said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And we echo that cry in our suffering. But the one whom we cry, remember me, to, is the one who not only promises to remember us, but he's also the one that promises to lift up our heads and to restore us and redeem us and to make us new. There is hope in whatever it is that you're going through. And his name is Jesus. Joseph had no way in the world to know what God was keeping him in prison for. And you might not know why you were in the pit today. But Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and which we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Ian Dugweed wrote this. There are plenty of people who suffer and are soured by it, becoming bitter and cynical. But the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, reminding us of the amazing love of God that has been given to us in Christ. The same experience that would have otherwise make our sour and, uh, our sour, sour and bitter gradually makes us sweet and tender-hearted we slowly become more compassionate towards others in their weakness, joyful in the midst of our pain and disappointment, and filled with hope that God's good purposes will bear gracious fruit in and through us. Joseph experienced time and time again this flattening of the curve. Hope's up, hope's down. And yet he continued in faith, trusting in God's sovereign plan and his gracious plan that it would come to fruition. And you may be in the pit today, but it's never too dark. And it's never too deep. The curve is never too bottomed out. Christ is with us in the pit. He will never leave us and forsake us. Therefore, we need to guard against cynicism. We need to hold on to faith, and we need to put our trust squarely on Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Thanks for listening to this message from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Mora, Minnesota. 
For more information about our church, you can find us on the web at www.emmanuelmora.com or on Facebook by searching for Emmanuel Mora. If you like what you've heard, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to partner with us in our mission, consider giving financially to our ministry. You can conveniently give right from your mobile device by texting any word to 320-313-1950. There are options for one-time giving or recurring gifts on the schedule that you set. Thanks again for listening. Emmanuel Mora, Knowing Christ and Making Him Known.